today on Trial Watch. How can they even consider sending her back to that kind of an environment? Pat Pierce rescued little Nancy from a horribly abusive mother and raised the child as lovingly as her own. So why does the state want to send Nancy back? Last week on Trial Watch, this woman accused her boss of raping her at the office. Today, he's in the studio to give his version of what really happened. All this and more today on Trial Watch. Real people, real trials. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Weller, and with me is my co-anchor, attorney Lisa Specht. Hello. Welcome to Trial Watch. Adriana Nunez won the biggest sexual harassment case in California history. You saw the story last week on Trial Watch. Adriana accused her boss, Gary Netherland, of raping her in their law office. Well, today, Gary Netherland is in our studio to challenge what Adriana swore was the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Law clerk Adriana Nunez recently changed history, winning the single largest sexual harassment suit in California. A jury awarded her $480,000, finding that the law firm where she worked, Eskinos and Adler, failed to investigate rumors that Supervisor Gary Netherland had allegedly raped and harassed Nunez in the office. Well, Mr. Netherland continu continuously just threatened me with loss of my job. The very next morning, he told me that if I told anyone that he had raped me, that I would lose my job. Adriana tried to go about everyday life, denying the incident. But finally, she confided in office girlfriends. Basically, everyone knew of the harassment that was going on. And, um, you know, there was office gossip going around. They did nothing. They, they really um, kind of put it to the side like nothing was going on. They kind of like brushed it off. Once the word was out, Netherland forced Adriana to sign a declaration claiming that nothing had happened between the two employees. Well, it was the only income I had to support my family members and myself. And I, I wanted to be a professional. And I felt that if I stayed there, I could maybe work my way up to be a legal assistant like I wanted to be. But Netherland continued to harass her. Emotionally shattered, she left Eskinos and Adler and took a job at the law office of attorney Philip Kay. She came to my office after hours and she started to tell me about uh, a rape that had happened at her last job and how a man that had supervised her had raped her after hours in the office uh, that she worked in. After counseling from Kay, Adriana decided to fight. She filed suit against her old law firm. In the courtroom, she triumphed. Still, Adriana continues to live in torment. I'd like to see him in prison. I think he deserves to be there. Um, he has no remorse for what he's done. Um, I, I don't know. I just have to um, be able to deal with it now and take care of myself now. But I'm still working on that. Gary Netherland was never charged with rape. In fact, he was never charged with any crime. And yet he's been tried and convicted in the court of public opinion. Well, until today, Gary refused requests for interviews. And outside of court, he's never responded to the accusations against him. But now he's ready to talk. When we return, you'll hear Gary Netherland's version of what happened in the law firm late that night. Because what, what we'll do now. We're back with Gary Netherland now. The man Adriana Nunez says raped her and then sexually harassed her regularly at the law firm where they both worked. And Gary, you've just seen Adriana's account of what happened and you wanted to be here today to tell us your side of the story. What did happen that night at the law firm? Well, um, we have evidence of the relationship and how it started. It started off, she solicited the relationship. She wrote me letters and um, I'll read part of the letter that she just wrote. Well, I'd rather, instead of reading the part of the letter that, that she wrote, tell me first, was, are you claiming that this, there was no rape, that this was a consensual relationship, that you had a sexual relationship with her, a dating relationship? Oh, absolutely. This was um, a case of uh, 
the fatal attraction in the office. Mm -hmm. um, she says in her letter, I just wanted you to know, this was prior to mm -hmm. our um, relationship, that I have been thinking about you as I do every night. It keeps me happy. What do you think about me as you know I am not a young little girl, but a woman who wants to have the opportunity to be a good friend? And she later on continues to ask me to meet her. Now, is this a letter that she wrote to you before or after the night at the law firm before. that she claimed she was raped? She wrote this before. So yeah. this is a, a woman that apparently had a crush on you, is what you're saying, um, right. before yeah. that night. Well, that night, did you rape her? No, I think that um, for her to say that, is, is a, she's trying to, to kill me through the court system in the way that uh, Glenn Close would try to kill why would she do this? Why would she do this? Because, because she's a she rejected was... lover, is that what you're saying? Exactly. So did you have sex with her? Do you agree that you had sex with her that night? You just say it wasn't rape, and she says it was rape. Right. She says in her deposition, he pulled my hair, he forced me to... Well, well before we get I into the depositions, because I think... The violentness that she uses here, the... I think, would be in great contrast to the sensuousness that she used in the letter that, in the she, letter wrote that she wrote to me immediately thereafter. Well, let me ask you, you had an opportunity to testify at this trial, the, the case that she brought against the law firm for sexual harassment. Um, do you feel you got your, your side of the story out at that trial? Of course not, because I was uh, not a party to the trial. I, the trial was between the law firm and her. But you did testify, and the jury foreman told us that the jury believed that you had raped her and sexually harassed her. Um, why would he say that? Because you did have a chance to testify, and... I had a chance to be directly examined and not a chance to be um, examined by anyone to find the truth out of what they're going to ask you yes and no questions, and that, that's what you have to answer. I would like to show this letter. I came here to show the truth of what happened, not to be persecuted. Okay. No, I, I'm sorry. We don't want you to, to feel persecuted, and I did let you read from the letter, but I this think... This is a different letter. This letter shows that she says in her letter that it was mutual. Can you see her handwriting? Uh-huh. Oh, she here, says me... that our relationship was mutual. Right. She says... Uh, when was this letter written? This was written exactly... Um, after the alleged rape? Immediately after. Right? Immediately after. She says, I cared about you, and I've spent many hours thinking about you and everything you've said to me. She admits that I came on to you, she says. It only seemed natural. Is there a this date on that letter? Far from... There's no date on this letter, uh -huh. but it discusses the relationship that we had. I can... You kissed me and told me how sensual I was. You thought... Um, okay, well, let me just ask you a question, getting back to this. Why would a woman who um, has not been raped institute a court action against a lawsuit that would be public? Why would she bring this charge if it were not true? Because it's a difficult charge for a woman to bring publicly. Well, not if you have a lawyer, a lawyer who's not going to show the, but the not, both sides of the story. But, he was able to... He knew that I would be able to get out of the lawsuit, so I did. I got out of the lawsuit. I signed a document saying that I would not file a suit against her. Um, and then he pitted the law firm against me, and the law firm naturally tried to show that I was the bad guy. So they tried to show that what happened was a criminal offense, if that's what she wanted it to be, believing that by showing a criminal encounter had happened, they would not be liable. So the law firm pointed the finger of guilt at you in order to get themselves off the hook. That's the way it looks. Uh, one quick question. We're out of time, but what has all this done to your life? Well, it's pretty much destroyed my career. Um, now for therapy, I'm writing a book about this. I, uh, Are you working? No. You're unemployed. Have you taken the bar exam? With this hanging over your head, it's a little impossible to do. I don't think that they would admit you at this point. Thank you, Mr. Netherland. Rob. Well, just ahead on Trial Watch, would you want this little girl to live with an abusive mother who's also charged with selling crack? Well, the state of Michigan does. There was such severe child abuse in little Nancy Mercado's house that it made national headlines. Well, Pat Pierce became Nancy's foster mother, making her a loving home for nine years. But incredibly, the state of Michigan now wants to take the little girl away from Pat and reunite her with her biological mother.
who was recently arrested for selling crack. Was Nancy home earlier? And she was home when she went across the street. Oh, she's going to play with the girls, huh? Nancy Mercado is 10 years old, and the government agency that's supposed to protect her wants to send her into a potentially dangerous situation. The agency wants to send her back to her biological mother, who was convicted of one of the worst cases of child abuse in Michigan history. How can they even consider sending her back to that kind of an environment? Why are our children being thrown into positions that they don't belong? Pat Pierce is the foster mother who's nurtured and loved Nancy for most of her life, ever since she first came to live with her as an infant more than nine years ago. I had raised her. I was her psychological mother. I was her shoulder. I was her arm. I was her shield to protect her. Uh, and I decided at that point she really did not know her biological mother. And that wasn't home, that, that her place with me was home, has been, and will be. Nancy was 18 months old when she was taken away from her real mother, Carolina Ortiz. Ortiz's abuse of Nancy's sister, Rafaela, shocked the nation. The little girl was discovered in a filthy home, forced to sit for 10 hours at a time on a potty seat, covered with excrement and half starved. I don't believe that Nancy remembers very much of the family life prior to coming to us. Um, I believe that that was kind of pushed aside as it had been with the other children. None of them wanted to talk about the problems. Nancy and four of her 14 older brothers and sisters came to live with Pat. We can't show you their faces because Pat fears the other siblings may try to harm her. One by one, those children were either sent to live with their various fathers or other family members. Now the Michigan Department of Social Services wants to send Nancy back to live with Carolina Ortiz, who currently is charged with selling crack cocaine to an undercover policewoman. I don't understand how the Department of Social Services, knowing well that this mother was arrested, can send this child or even consider sending this child home. Pat, terrified of what would happen to Nancy should she be sent home, went to court desperately seeking to win custody, a virtual impossibility for foster parents. I'll never forget that first day she was here and she broke down crying saying they were going to take her baby. And I realized that I could not have received emotions any greater from a biological mother sitting across my desk. This was Nancy's mother. Pat's lawyer says Carolina Ortiz doesn't seem very interested in getting her daughter back. Ironically enough, in most of these cases, the litigants, the parties who are fighting for custody, always attend the court hearings, if for no other reason than to psychologically let the court know how concerned they are. In this case, we've had over half a dozen hearings in this matter, and at no time has Carolina Ortiz appeared in the circuit court. Still, the Michigan Department of Social Services insists that Carolina Ortiz has mended her ways and should be allowed to raise Nancy. But department officials refused to talk with Trial Watch. The Department of Social Services wanted to reunite the biological family. Uh, I, I would say that as a general rule, that's probably in most children's best interests. But there are many exceptions, especially in a case such as Nancy's, where she has lived for almost her entire life for nine of the last ten and a half years with one other party, the psychological mother. Like the toy bears she collects, Nancy's grown into a loving little girl under Pat's care. But she changes as quickly as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde when she sees her natural family. When Nancy comes home after a visit with her biological family, she sometimes is very apprehensive. She's also sometimes very physically aggressive. Um, it takes a couple days at most for her to settle back down to the normal, wonderful child that she is. It didn't take the wisdom of Solomon for the Michigan Circuit Court to decide which mother Nancy should live with. Pat Pierce was granted both temporary and permanent custody of the child she's raised and loved since infancy. Being a parent is more than just conception and giving birth. 
the bonding that takes place, the memories, the shared experiences that occur between a child and another adult really is how you base the child's relationship to that third party. Not just myself, but my husband, my sister, her children, my mother, my cousins, all my relatives and my friends love this child like she's in a home where she belongs. Nancy turned 10 years old last month, but Pat says she's the one that got the best birthday present of all. She got Nancy. What a nice story. Mm -hmm. Well, here's another nice story, actually. She used to make them laugh, but now she's making law. From Dobie Gillis to Harvard Law School, next on Trial Watch. Well, in the 50s, she was Stu Irwin's impish TV daughter. In the 60s, she was the brains behind Dobie Gillis. Today, she's the brains behind a woman's legal service. Meet Sheila James Kuehl and learn how a former child star became a respected lawyer. Dobie, Pookchen! No, Zelda, please, not again. Dobie and Amarato, what are you doing hanging on to Mary Ann's arm in the manner and becoming someone sworn to another, namely me? I am not sworn to you. Her name was Zelda Gilroy, and television had never seen a brainier teenager. She could do anything. She put together a production company. She ran Dobie Gillis' campaign for president. I mean, it was very outrageous. The interesting thing about her, however, was that even though she could do anything she wanted, she only wanted one thing, which was Dobie. And so the smartest woman in the world in 1959 really only wanted one thing, which was to get married. But the 1990s woman wants more than just a husband. And now Sheila James Kuehl has achieved success both as a law professor and as a founder of the Southern California Women's Law Center. The center specializes in women's issues such as sex discrimination and domestic violence. But Sheila's first television family was as wholesome as apple pie. The year was 1950. Seven-year-old Sheila played Jackie Irwin, youngest daughter of Stu Irwin, on The Trouble with Father. It was really interesting being a child actress. Um, I loved it. I think it's a great way to grow up. It was very, a very positive experience for me, and it also gave me a lot of confidence. In 1959, Sheila landed the role of Zelda Gilroy, the girl who alphabetically would always be just one seat away from Dobie Gillis. Whenever I watch the reruns, I feel like Zelda is a sort of little sister of mine. She's constantly 18 or 19 or 20 years old, I mean, no matter what. And I'm constantly getting older. The show ran until 1963, and another series, Broadside, followed. But it was soon canceled, and for the first time since childhood, Sheila found herself unemployed as an actress. She worked in administration at UCLA, and then, in 1969, went to Vietnam on a USO tour. It was a radicalizing experience for me, and it changed my politics a lot. So it was both campus and uh, the war. And when I came back, I decided I wanted to go to law school. Sheila went to Harvard, where she won top honors in a student trial competition judged by Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. I don't think there's any question that what I learned as an actress made it possible for me to talk, stand on my feet and talk. After graduation, Sheila began teaching law at UCLA. But her dream was to start a facility which would specialize in women's issues. And in 1989, with partner Abby Liebman, Sheila began the Women's Law Center. The work they've done has already benefited women in the areas of employment, education, reproductive rights, and child care. The law is really different. It's the ability to really use everything you've got, to really think your way through something, to really make a great argument, to make a difference in people's lives, to go up and, you know, strong arm the legislature to pass a law that helps battered women or uh, gets more child care or whatever. It feels really good in a way that acting doesn't. While her TV characters live on in reruns, she's breaking new legal ground every day. Ah, Zelda. All right. It's time now for today's Snap Judgment. Lisa is going to give you the facts in a real-life case, then you hand down the decision. We're going to see if you can make the same call as the judge. And here goes. The old saying goes, every dog has his day. But nowhere does it say that every dog should have his day in court. But that's just what happened to a mutt named Runaway. When his owners, Rex and Judy Wheatland, divorced, the property settlement went smoothly enough, but neither person would give up possession of the two-year-old dog. Rex flew his sister in from France to testify about how much he loved that dog. And Judy brought in a life-size portrait of Runaway. 
and turned down Rex's offer of $20,000 for the pooch, even though she had only $15 in her bank account. The wrangling dra dragged on for over a year. What do you think the judge finally decided? I'll be back with a dog's fate right after this pause. So, when a couple divorces, who gets custody of the dog? The judge in Orange County, California, ruled the mutt runaway was what he called a, quote, child substitute for Rex and Judy Wheatland. And, as usually happens with children, the judge ordered joint custody. Judy and her ex get to keep runaway on alternate months, but each has visitation rights. In addition, neither person can take the dog out of California without the written permission from the other. Now, be honest, was that your decision also? Absolutely. Joint custody, I think, was a good decision. It was a Solomon-like decision. Well, that's it for us for today. Join us again tomorrow for Trial Watch. Real trials, real people.